Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Agnabeni. Uh, I signed up today to give a talk about .NET Core 2.1 in production, but unfortunately that talk is canceled, so we're going to do .NET Core 2.2 in production. <laughs> That's 0.1 higher. It should be backwards compatible with the previous talk according to December. Uh, so I'm Steve Agnabeni. I work for a company called Namely. I've been working with .NET since the, basically the beginning, uh, SQL Server since the 90s, and I'm a Pluralsight author. And uh, I have a couple courses about TypeScript out there. You can find me on Twitter at mic.net. Uh, so I work for a company called Namely, and at Namely, our mission is to uh, build a better workplace for mid-sized companies. We uh, write HR software, human resources software, for companies in the United States. Uh, Namely was founded with a Rails app uh, that uh, forms the core of our main uh, uh, HR application today. We also have a payroll app, and that's ASP.NET Web Forms. Uh, so getting these two things to talk to each other is a bit of a challenge for us, and, and they are uh, what we like to call in the software world monoliths, which is to say that uh, they're very self-contained, right? Um, so uh, talking a little bit about scaling for startups, uh, you hear a lot on the internet about how monoliths are bad. Monoliths are bad. Monoliths are really hard to scale, and that's true. And uh, you, you hear a lot about, oh, well, you, what you should have instead of monoliths is service-oriented architecture, where everything is its own little service. And this is great, uh, but it, it's very expensive, and it's very complicated. It adds a lot of complexity. Monoliths tend to be very simple. Right? They're, they're small. They're very self-contained. There's a lot of problems you don't have when you have a monolith. And the only thing that you don't get, kind of get for free is uh, scaling. Uh, but I don't want to discourage anyone from using a monolith. I, what we found is that a really good way to start is with a monolith. And then when you start having customers, which means you start having traffic, do a monolith with more hardware. Throw hardware at the problem. Okay, this is the way that you advance a monolith. And it's actually important to do it this way because this means you actually have customers. The reason you're having scalability problems is because you have customers. And you could throw hardware at the problem and that buys you time to start doing services. Okay, so start with a monolith, get customers from customers, use money from customers to build services. Right? Uh, so planning services for Namely. In mid-2016, Namely, we decided, okay, it seems like we have customers, we have a, a business model, this is actually really working for us. Let's think about what we want the future of our applications to look like. So on the Namely side, we had Ruby on Rails, uh, ran on Linux in Docker containers on top of Kubernetes. We were actually very early on with Kubernetes. We guessed right, I think. Uh, so this is 2016 already, and those are running on top of AWS uh, EC2 instances. Uh, on the payroll side, we uh, had uh, C Sharp and VB.net. Like I said, it's an ASP.NET Web Forms app uh, running on Windows and IIS and on EC2 instances as well. Uh, and so we started thinking, like, where's our future? What do we want to do? Like, what, is, what do we want the future to look like? Uh, and in coordination with our SRE teams, uh, on the payroll side, we decided Linux and Docker and Kubernetes were good. But the thing we didn't want to do is convert all of our payroll code to Ruby. It didn't really feel right for the types of applications that we were writing, uh, lots of kind of financial calculations and things like that. Um, Ruby, to this day, I look at it and I'm, I think to myself, how could this ever work? Um, but it works somehow. I mean, we, do, we have really good software. I, it's just not for me, maybe. Uh, so we decided we wanted to uh, have our future stack be kind of whatever language the team that's writing the software wants to write it in, that's kind of fine on a short list of approved languages. Uh, but that underneath that, they'd all be running on Linux, in Docker, on Kubernetes supported by EC2. And I'm looking at my watch here uh, that doesn't exist because, I don't know, it's sort of old, old people do this, right? They look at their wrist. Um, so later on today, we're actually going to EKS, which is Amazon's hosted Kubernetes, and that's going to happen in like three hours. So it should be fun going to production with EKS and really, really soon. Um, so we, we had a question. So how do we write C Sharp on Linux? And this is a number of years ago. Uh, we had the choice basically of thinking about Mono because that was something that was out at that time. It did exist. Um, but we were kind of old school Microsoft developers. We loved, uh, we, we, if it didn't come from Microsoft, we were still kind of scared of it, right? This is pretty early days. And so we decided to go with .NET Core, which had been released and, and was on, I think, 1.0 at that time. Uh, so we had our uh, payroll web that talked to payroll DB. Uh, and in February 2017, we had a hackathon at work, and we created three brand new .NET Core web API projects, and we called these services. Uh, and they ran on .NET Core 1.1. Uh, they were in Linux and Docker, which is great. Uh, we used the .NET new templates, uh, so all of them had a like, kind of a React front end and, and web API back end talking to SQL Server. Uh, and uh, none of them won the hackathon, so that was kind of sad. Um, but uh, the jokes on, I, I think the thing that won was some kind of like machine learning AI blockchain thing. I'm not really sure. Um, it's exciting for a hackathon, but it's not, it wasn't for us. It's not business worthy. Um, but the good news is actually this is successful because all three of these services are still in production this day and we followed them through the whole tool chain. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, so question though, I, I said services. 
are these really services? Um, it's a, if, if you notice, it's, it's not really independent. It's still kind of talking to the payroll DB. Uh, and so we had this idea that services are going to allow us to scale infinitely. But it turns out that they're all still talking to the same relational database. And there's really only so big that you can scale a SQL server before you start to continue to have kind of scalability problems and blocking problems and contention problems and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, so in terms of services, I would say, in fact, these are not services, even though we kind of use that term. What they really are is, I'm not sure if we invented this. I don't think we did. But it's, they're really BFFs, which is not best friends forever. Um, it is called backend for front end. Okay, so backend for front end is a captive backend that is specifically tied to a front end service, like something like React or whatever, uh, on the client side. And this implements all the server side calls that are appropriate for that front end, and then talks to the database in the back end. Right. Um, so they're not services, even though we kind of use that use that term. Um, so. Uh, talking about scale for startups, remember I said uh, the idea is that you can throw hardware at it, and that's, that works for a while. Um, and if you're going to go with services, I highly recommend using an approach like we're using now, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but there's this sort of thing called a distributed monolith, which is what we started building, right? We started building lots of BFFs, or back ends for front ends, and you wind up with a distributed monolith. You basically are kind of still talking to the same database or some sort of shared things, and you wind up duplicating a lot of logic in a lot of different places, sometimes even in different languages, uh, which can be really problematic. And, and I like to say that the road from monolith to distributed monoliths is paved with BFFs. Okay, so you need to be very careful about not doing this sort of thing if you want to sort of live in this sort of glorious service-oriented uh, Valhalla heaven type thing. All right. Uh, so, so .NET Core 2.1, oh, pardon me, 1.1. It uh, was pretty fast. Uh, lets us develop on Mac, Linux, and Windows, which is kind of nice. Uh, it worked great in Docker, uh, and with Linux, and uh, there was really good command line tooling. Uh, ASP.NET uh, had a, something called middleware, which is really really nice. What it lets you do is intercept the uh, HTTP uh, pipeline uh, at various points throughout. And you can do things like, for example, uh, we wrote a, a middleware which is, uh, works with our authentication, with an authentication proxy that we have. And basically, if somebody comes in and uh, doesn't have the right headers on their thing, uh, we reject them. So the, the call never gets to the controller, which is really nice. And we can decorate our controllers with various rules that are appropriate to our specific uh, authentication requirements and say like this particular controller requires this group and this group or like this group or that group that kind of thing uh, and it's really nice we implemented that with middleware and it's I don't know 100 lines of code and, and we use it all over the place it's really really nice and the user the, the people that are writing the end services don't have to think about it they just decorate their methods and all of a sudden everything's secure which is really nice uh, and of course it's open source right that's the reason why we are all here and uh, and .NET Core 1.1 uh, was was open source problem Lots of APIs were missing. We had to do crazy things like doing polyfills for .NET, right? That's something you would expect from JavaScript where there's not really a kind of core framework. And in .NET, it was just very, we were very allergic to it. You know, we didn't really like doing that. Uh, and the docs were wrong, and there was the whole project, that JSON drama thing, and the tooling was bad, like Visual Studio was, was not ready for it. You know, it was just problematic. So really, we found that .NET Core 1.1, while we got it to work and while we shipped it to production, was really for early adopters. So in August of 2017, .NET Core 2.0, yay! Visual Studio 15.3, yay! And .NET Standard 2, yay! OK, this is all really good stuff. This is when .NET Core really became decent. Uh, so the APIs that we needed were back. They added 20,000 APIs. The docs were better. The tooling was better. It was really fast and stable. I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Uh, we had a little thing with Kubernetes. It was not a big deal. We figured it out. Um, the only thing, that actually, we were kind of sad about with .NET Core 2 was that it didn't, didn't work right with the full framework until basically uh, 471, which was three months later, um, and it caused the, because that was delayed, it caused us to, to do all the work that we needed for Net standard two, and then we kind of got bored with it and didn't actually port it to our monolith, and so we then wound up supporting essentially two versions of the same thing for like a year and a half or whatever, which was kind of a drag. But anyway, we we it's, we survived. Um, so when .NET Core 2.0 came out, uh, there was a blog post by Stephen Taub from Microsoft showing microbenchmarks. Microbenchmarks are benchmarks without context, right? So a really tiny thing. And so this particular one doesn't matter the code, but he's basically testing how fast NQing and DQing objects in a queue is. And um, uh, he, he advertised dozens of uh, speed ups, two, between two and 10 times. That's pretty exciting as part of your core framework. Uh, now, the interesting thing, though, was not this blog post or even that .NET Core 2.0 was so much faster. It, the interesting thing to me was this follow-up by a guy named Andre uh, Atkinson, uh, who at the time worked for JetBrains. Uh, and he showed uh, the same blog post, basically, but using something called benchmark.net. Uh, so this is a library that I recommend everybody check out and at least sort of understand what it does. 
and I recommend just searching for the .NET Core 2.0 blog post uh, on the performance. Uh, what, what Benchmark.NET does is it, is it abstracts away all the complexity of dealing with um, timing for micro benchmarks. Like, the, like say for example, um, you're emailing somebody at the same time your benchmark is running, right? You know, so so your your computer is doing work, and so it. It's very easy to get uh, things that are pre measuring in the nanoseconds or the microseconds to be slightly wrong based on other stuff your computer is doing. And so this benchmark.net will run things a lot of times and it figures out just the right number of things to have a, a reasonable statistical significance of the, uh, of the benchmarks, which is really, really good. Uh, so I highly recommend checking that out. But anyway, people were like, oh, benchmark.net is cool. I bet I could use benchmark.net too. And all the people on the .NET core team started doing that. And we're going to see it made tremendous differences in 2.1. So this is actually a big cultural shift, I think. Uh, so, so at Namely, we started working on something called .NET Helpers. And this is our common library for, for .NET services and applications. Uh, so it has abstractions for things like Autofac. Could anyone use uh, Autofac here? OK, so yeah, very good. Uh, how do we use dependency injection generally for anything? A fair, okay, so, so almost a, a very large number. OK, so dependency, uh, Autofac is an implementation of dependency injection for .NET. Um, it's the, uh, the one that they probably copied when Microsoft introduced their own sort of dependency injection thing. Um, it's really complicated, and I, I love what it does for it, but I hate working with it. Uh, the nice thing about Autofac is it's totally um, abstract. You can extract it totally away. And I'll give you an example. So in .NET Helpers, we had the one, there's one guy at our, at our whole company that knows how Autofac works, right? So, so we had this one person write helpers for all the normal people, like, pardon me, I touched the microphone, all the normal people like me to use. Okay, so like an example, in the beginning of all our programs, we have a, a menu of all the things the program needs, and it uses .NET Helpers, helper methods to abstract that away. That is an example. Uh, we're going to see here, all right, this application, this is in the beginning, like in the startup, it gets called by, uh, by a startup. I'm going to add a Postgres DB connection factory. I'm going to add a payroll DB connection factory. I'm going to add a, a reader and writer for the service database. I'm going to add a reader and writer for payroll DB. And that's it, one line to set all that stuff up. And the nice thing about it is when you set all the stuff up in the beginning and you have understanding of it, and by the way, each of these things are 100% covered, like ridiculously covered by tests, um, and we, it means the application developer writing their service doesn't have to deal with all this low-level nonsense that they don't care about. Um, that wasn't the laser. All this low-level nonsense that they don't care about, right? Um, and uh, when I'm using it, I could just say, hey, I'm going to write a query class, and I want uh, an iDatabase reader, and the one that I want is the payroll DB one. And that's it. I don't have to deal with connection strings. I don't have to set my app remember to set my application name in the connection string. That's all done up here so that the application name is in there. And so every .NET Core application we have sets that so we know which person to blame when the database server is having problems. Right? All that stuff is abstracted away. So we really like what Autofac does for us, and we like using it because we don't have to deal with Autofac directly. We just do it indirectly. Uh, we use Dapper, which is the Stack Overflow uh, interface for, uh, for iDatabase, uh, the, the iDatabase interface, which we really like a lot. Uh, we do testing with .NET helpers, we, which integrates some helpers for uh, XUnit, for nSubstitute. Um, we use Fluent Assertions, which is a library that lets you do in your tests like you do the, uh, the uh, arrange and act, and then the assert phase is like some variable should be five. And it lets you kind of write out the assertions in a prose in, in English uh, or whatever. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, we have all of our uh, tooling uh, integrated with this as well. Uh, so Logzio, which is our Elk stack that we use. Uh, New Relic, which is a, a company that helps um, analyze performance and stuff like that. We use Datadog for graphs and charts and stuff. Uh, and bug snag. Uh, and all this comes to us for free, quote unquote, when we use dot helpers in our, in our libraries. Uh, LN authentication, I talked about the middleware, and gRPC, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Anyone here use gRPC? Uh, five ish, six ish, okay. Cool. So with that standard, .NET helpers, it took us a while, but we finally got there. Now, my favorite kind of PR is we're deleting code from our monolith because all that stuff is implemented in .NET helpers. And even though it's it's written uh, .NET Core, we compile it to .NET Standard, and we can use it as a NuGet package in our ASP.NET Web Forms thing, and it lets us delete code, which is great, because it's probably code that didn't have tests and stuff like that, and now it totally does, which is really nice. Uh, so protobufs. Okay, so remember how I said BFFs aren't really services? And, and the problem is that you, don't, you deal with a concrete implementation that's meant for a specific front end. And that can be a problem because it's not flexible. And the minute you need to new, do a new thing um, or have something else that was not that front end call it, you often have to add extra stuff to it. And it starts to get more complex. Uh, and so we use something called Protobuf to help us write uh, 
language uh, agnostic services, uh, meaning that the client can be in whatever language and the server can be in whatever language. Now, for our services, we write them all in C-sharp, but there's other teams that write their services uh, using Go, uh, using, you could theoretically use Python, you could use Ruby. Uh, there's a lot of different, a lot of choices. I, I, there's a dozen or something like that languages that the Docker Protoc uh, supports. And the client and server code is generated for you. Uh, so it's hard to see, but uh, here's an example of a service. This is actual real code that we use in, in the proto format. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of its own language, but it's just for defining stuff. So we have a namely pace cycles package defined that turns into a namespace in C sharp. And then I have a service called pace cycles that gets created as, a, as, a, as sort of a, a class. And there's a method on that class called rollback pace cycle. And it takes a rollback pace cycle request and it returns empty, which basically means it'll throw or work, right? Uh, and then here's the, the message, which is, describes what this looks like, and it's an object that has a UUID on it. And that's all. And so what we do is we run this container that we have, which just wraps the, the uh, compiler, which is from Google. And we do r Docker run, here's my proto compiler thing, and paste cycles that proto. So we're pointing the command line tool at the proto file that we just wrote out. And what we get is this. Uh, in Visual Studio, we get a, a namely gRPC project that gets created and it gets compiled. And all the stuff necessary to be the clients of the service or to implement the service is set up for us automatically. Now, I got a question. Do you see on the side here, there's these sort of like red what prohibit signs? I don't know if this is the same sign in, in Europe or not. Anyone know what that means in Visual Studio? If you see that next to a file? It means it's not checked into source control. It's, it's, it's intentionally ignored in source control. Why would we want to ignore these files? This is the core of our services. Any ideas? They're generated. Who checks in their DLLs to source control? Nobody. Well, oh, you do. I mean, there are certainly some, some scenarios. Like, don't get me wrong. Maybe for external dependencies, that's a thing that people do. Um, but like in general, like if you're writing some code, you don't check in the binary output from source control because it's not really relevant, right? You're not, it, uh, except for certain circumstances, you don't want to check it in because it's, it's made for you at the time. And so we don't check these in. What we check in is the proto file. And during our CI and CD pipeline stuff, um, it generates the actual C sharp code uh, or Java code or Go code or whatever language it's implemented in. Um, and it makes these things for us. Uh, and here I'll tell you a little thing. I know this is a TypeScript room. Uh, one of the things that we've added recently, we don't actually use it yet, but instead of doing C sharp, uh, let me just go back real quick. See how the language, I pick C sharp. This is where it, the only thing you would do different to get a Go file or, or Ruby or Python is change this last part to say literally Ruby or Go or Python and it generates the code for you that implements that proto, which is pretty neat. Um, and uh, so now we have one called web. Any guess what that does? TypeScript. TypeScript. It generates the JavaScript code to do the binary serialization and deserialization of the, proto buff, uh, of the messages to the protobuf format, which is a binary format. So it's more efficient on the wire than JSON. And you get a d.ts file, which describes the service and how to interact with it. That's awesome, right? It's good times because all of a sudden you're dealing with a strongly typed interface to your thing and then the implementation you do whatever you want with. So on the client side there's one call. Uh, now again, we're not doing this yet so I'm describing it as awesome because I'm not aware of all the problems it probably has. But anyway, we don't, we don't do this just yet. We use something called gRPC Gateway so we make our clients by, by hand. Um, uh, but this is something that's out there and you get a d.ts which describes uh, the, a get and a set and a serialized method and as object and stuff like that. But again, there's that UUID that's, a, that's a, implemented as a string in JavaScript, right? Uh, so that's kind of neat. Uh, so in 2018, .NET Core 2.1 came out, which is pretty cool. Uh, there was another performance blog post, this time based on Benchmark.net. And again, they showed two and ten times speed ups on .NET Core 2. So that's amazing. We're already pretty fast, and we got even faster for a lot of different stuff. So the micro benchmarks are all over the place. That original blog post that came out after the .NET Core 2 blog post changed the culture on the .NET Core team, uh, and they started chasing little, little improvements all throughout the framework. It made a real big difference in how fast .NET Core is, and we, as the users of .NET Core, all win based on that. Uh, oh, what did I do? Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's back. Okay, great. Panic. Um, yeah, so we, we saw a lot of tweets like this. Guess where I upgraded my site to .NET Core yesterday? ASP.NET Core, right? Pretty amazing. Like the performance is really good. So I wanted to show you a real graph. Okay, so this is something we got out of Datadog. I, I exported this last summer, uh, and here is uh, .NET Core 2.0 memory usage for a particular service, around I don't know 90-ish megabytes used. .NET Core 2.1 around I don't know 50 something like that, 55, right? 
pretty good. No, no code changes, just going to .NET Core 2.1 from 2.0. Now, I have a pro there's a problem with this, though. It's, it's Photoshopped. Now, the funny thing is that with a sort of graph like this, you would expect that maybe the y-axis would be Photoshopped, right, up and down. The y-axis is actually correct. It's the x-axis that's Photoshopped. And the reason is because we had to revert. We couldn't use .NET Core 2.1. And I got a little, little hint. You see this part? A little bit of a jump there, isn't it? <clears throat> OK, so we'll get to that in a moment. So amazing performance, even better, right? Lower memory footprint, .NET Global Tools. So who here uses NPM? All right, so npm-g, right, is a global tool. This is the same thing, but for NuGet. You can deploy to NuGet.org a package, and then people can install it as a global tool with .NET Core 2.1. Pretty cool. Uh, it has span of T. It has all this other stuff. It's really good. Cons is bugs. Okay, so we ran into a lot of problems with .NET Core 2.1. Uh, so the first is the New Relic Bad Image Format exception. So basically, uh, there was a breaking change in the way that code, uh, the code versioning profiler worked in .NET Core 2.1. This is me copying out of a blog post to try to speak about it intelligently, as if I fully understand this. But the bottom line is that basically New Relic, which is a product that we use to analyze the performance of .NET Core, uh, they assumed the JIT would only happen once. And that was true uh, for a given piece of code. That was true for basically forever until .NET Core 2.1 came out. Uh, and unfortunately, it was no longer true, and so we would get these errors uh, booting up the thing. It just didn't work at all. Uh, and so basically, uh, with the, but the, here's the awesome thing about .NET Core and open source is we all kind of appreciate. There's the bug. There's the fix. We could see what the fix was, and this is when it was actually released. It was a couple months later. So like they're still working on how quickly they release stuff. But that's like pretty neat that we can see the bug report and get the actual fix and what, actually, what, what changed. So that's pretty neat stuff. Uh, problem was we had a summer of fun. So the .NET Core, there was a blog post that came out that said, hey, .NET Core is not going to be supported as, as of September. Meanwhile, the fix is due mid-August, which as we know, Microsoft always meets their deadlines for deploying stuff, right? Always. So, ah, panic, we're going to have a week to do this at best. Like, if they make, if they make their deadline, we're going to have a week to fix, and it's not going to be supported. I mean, it's like ridiculous. So we complained on Twitter, as we, as we like to do, and um, thankfully they listened. And uh, they released a new thing, and they said, well... We'll give you an extra month. I like how it's like crossed out in the blog post. <laughs> we'll give you an extra month. All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, we're going to have to cut this a little bit short. So there was, a C, uh, there was a problem with performance. Remember how I said that thing was Photoshopped? So here's our memory usage. It was going up a little bit and a little bit. This is Dog Quark 2.1. Now we'll go back. We reverted. To, this, is, this is us rebooting, right? Because I don't know what's wrong. Reboot it. We'll see, what, we'll see if it fixes it, right? That was the laugh line. I don't know what's wrong. Let's reboot it. Okay, so we rebooted it. Eh, it's still happening. Okay, revert. Now, straight, straight through. This is the CPU usage. This is actually a real graph. So basically none, right? So this is all just doo -doo 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 -doo. like I'm busy for no reason. And this is the actual traffic. So you can see it's completely uncorrelated with the traffic on this service, right? The CPU is just going bananas. Um, but memory was fine. Uh, and so it turned out there was a CPU leak. This is another pretty graph that somebody submitted. Uh, I don't think that's a real word, but basically there was stuff going on that was not real. Uh, and the, the root cause wound up being that HTTP client, which is part of .NET Core, uh, or .NET also, implements iDisposable, but you should not dispose it. Okay. Don't dispose it. Uh, there's a great blog post I love. You're using HTTP client wrong, and it's destabilizing your software. Like It's like one of the best titles I ever, ever read for a blog. Uh, this is actually old, so this is even for net, net full framework. So you're probably, if you're using HTTP client and you're disposing it, you're probably having this problem today, and you just don't notice it because of uh, something that happened. Uh, basically, they, they wrote a new managed sockets implementation. Remember back to that performance thing? Oh, we can squeeze out an extra 10 milliseconds on this baby, yeah, or mi microseconds or whatever. Um, but unfortunately, it interacts very badly with this bug, and it causes horrendous per CPU performance for nothing, basically. Uh, so the, the fix is... Oh, you could do a static HTTP client, which is a lot what the guidance used to be, but the problem is in Kubernetes and other container orchestrator type things, if you ever have DNS changes, static HTTP client doesn't update your DNS. So you wind up all of a sudden having bugs whenever things change their name or IP address or whatever. Uh, so you have to use this new thing called HTTP Client Factory. And I, I'm not going to go through the code, but basically you set up a thing like, for example, GitHub. And then later you resolve GitHub. And that's your client, okay? And so behind the scenes, HTTP Client Factory will do all the DNS re-resolution things and, and whatnot. And this is the right way to do it. So do it this way. Don't do it the other way. Or you'll wind up with CPU problems if you're on 2.1 or higher .NET Core. Uh, we had another bug with umkills out of memory. Like Kubernetes was just like, nope, sorry, you're dead. Um, 
And basically what was happening was that garbage collection was not happening soon enough, and so we were getting oom kills. And it turned out that in the fix, I, I love basically, we, oh, whoops, we were using the wrong way to determine how much memory was being. So they were just using the wrong number to figure out when GC should go, and so they switched it to the right number, and that made it better, except that, oops, we were still getting oom kills. And um, there's another issue out here, and there's still some talk about this. Uh, if you're using small containers, it's a problem. Um, so you don't have Kubernetes, the swap file in Kubernetes, and if you have a server GC turned on, this, this is sort of the mitigation, you get one heap per processor. So what happens if you have a 48 core machine? All of a sudden you're allocating multiple gigabytes of memory for a service that doesn't do that much, right? So you need to um, cut that back. In instead, you can actually use workstation GC on your services running inside of Kubernetes, and that means you have one heap and it also tends to run garbage collection a lot more. And so this is a workaround because you don't wind up wasting a lot of uh, space and time doing something that's not actually useful. So it's something to consider using investigating workstation GC for your services if you're running .NET Core on Kubernetes. And basically, if you have low memory limits, this is today the only way to do it. So this is actually not, it's not, it's not that it's not fixed. It's just something to be aware of. They're probably going to do something that's about it at some point. OK, so how we deploy .NET Core services. So we use GitHub. We deploy to Jenkins that does the build. We use CodeCov to check out what our test coverage is. Uh, we deploy our images that come out of Jenkins to something called Quay, which is a private repository for Docker images. Uh, we use something called Spinnaker, which comes out of um, uh, Netflix. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this, that's what actually puts our stuff out into Kubernetes. Uh, so .NET Core 2.2 came out in December. Yay. OK, we have some event tracing for Windows features. We have SQL access tokens for Azure Active Directory. Code injection prior to main. Why not just change the code? Um, ARM32 on Windows, OK. Uh, so this is basically the most boring release of .NET Core. Um, you know, we're, it's fine. It's 1.1 higher. That's fine. That's like this talk. So it's kind of boring. Um, anyway, just to wrap up, so .NET Core definitely works in production today. We are building our business around it. Uh, and, and it also works really nice with the protobuf stuff so people can do other, other uh, languages as well. Uh, we, we're really, really happy with that. Uh, it's good for services, good for command line tools, good for website backends. It works really well with Kubernetes with the exception of the um kill thing. Uh, if you have big pods that don't have tight memory limits, it's really, really nice. It works very well. Uh, interoperates all of our other tech with gRPC and it's super fast and more or less the bugs are worked out now or you know, hopefully we've run into it and we know how to work around it. Uh, so yeah, we're really happy and we're continuing to invest in .NET Core and uh, that's the talk. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, got, I think I got two minutes or otherwise anyone has questions I can answer after. So uh, uh, go ahead. I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, what would be the effort today to go for .NET Core? So not like you moved to 1.0. Yeah. Uh, well, I would hope, yeah. I mean, uh, definitely the two things I mentioned, um kills and, and um, uh, HTTP client being really weird and, or different, requiring uh, HTTP client factory and 2.1, those are the only things we're aware of. It depends on kind of what you have. Like, if you have web forms, it's rewrite. If you have MVC, it's close to rewrite. Uh, you know, uh, it really kind of de depends. So I, I highly recommend it for anything that's new. Check out .NET Core. You can see what you can do with the .NET, Core, uh, .NET new templates. Or they're based in the Visual Studio. If you like File New Project, um, they work really well, and that's what we use uh, to do it. So, uh, anybody else? I got one more minute. Sure. What's up? Do you have any experience with uh, dynamic library loading in .NET Core? Um, it, I mean, we consume DLLs as part of like NuGet packages, but not at runtime. So, no. Is, are you aware of some some challenges? Oh, oh, I see. Uh, it's in, it's entirely possible that's the case. Yeah, I, I don't I don't actually know. I, we don't do we don't do that. Oh, is it? Cool. Very good. Neat. Cool. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I did. I did not know that. So, so one side effect of that, I apologize. Sure. You, you can specify how many heaps you want to have. Yeah. Have for server to see, and it will say, okay, two heaps for on even on fifty processors. Yeah. But there is still a different heuristic for uh, allocating GC heaps. Right. So it's workstation and server. Hi, you're really, 
I think I'm out of time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and we found, I think it's like this is a shorthand way of, of working around it, where it will tend, with Workstation GC, it will tend to collect faster and keep a lower memory footprint overall. Server GC assumes that it's the only, only person on the server, right? The only app on the server, and so it'll kind of use that memory until it runs out. Uh, I think I'm out of time, so thank you very much, everybody, for having me here.